Let us not forget everything that happens is by the will of a holy will. It's time to unite and say that we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or to leave but to stand together. Streaming every day, various platforms. Trust me, you'll find a way. Soon, the followers. Ina alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to our series entitled The Heroines of Islam. And this is the series where as we discuss uh, the different uh, companions, female, compam female companions, namely, that live during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason why I began uh, this, this series is because so many women, uh, there it's a fact, we have a lot of women that convert to Islam every day. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of apostasy, a high apostasy rate amongst the women that convert too. And the reason being is because Islam has become so strange today and uh, women are told things uh, such as that they're not important, they're not special, uh, that there's no place for them in the world except inside the home having babies and, and worshiping a man. And this is not Islam. It's not Islam. Uh, the reason I started this series was to show the people that nowhere does Allah say because you are a female, you're less than anyone else. Nor does Allah say that because you're a female that you're invisible, that you have no say, no voice, and no no uh, are no uh, importance. Because when you learn the history of Islam, you learn that right behind the men were women. Right behind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he had 11, 12, 13 women that played effective roles in his life. They helped him to establish Islam, you know, as a religion and a way of life. And all of these women were visible. All of these women had a voice. All of these women were seen publicly by others. So that's what made me uh, start teaching this series. Uh, so as to tear down the misconceptions that the world today in 2024 has in regards to women in Islam. You know, women in Islam are just as important as men, okay? And uh, uh, the prohibitions for us, you know, are not... Uh, can somebody mute inside the Zoom room? The prohibitions uh, for us are not as rigid as people and as many as people believe there to be, okay? Um, from the way we dress to the way we speak, to whether we can leave the home. All of this stuff has been uh, 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 experienced by the prophet's wives, those female companions. They, were, they participated on the battlefield. They participated in the hospitals. They participated at home. It's all about knowing what your rights are as a Muslim woman, knowing what your role is is as a Muslim woman and fearing Allah first and foremost. And so today what I'm going to do is uh, one of the new shahadas, the new converts asked me if I could speak more, um, speak more about uh, the woman who breastfed the Prophet Muhammad, not the first lady, Thumayma. He had two. A lot of Muslims don't know the Prophet was breastfed by two women. The first woman that breast him was, breastfed him was a woman named Thumayma, and she also breastfed him, um, Abu Sufyan, Hamza, uh, Abu Salama. That's why they were all brothers too. 
You know, the prophet Muhammad, for those of you who don't know, was also the foster brother to Hamza. Hamza was not just his uncle, but a foster brother. Also, Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan wasn't just a cousin. He was also a foster brother to the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, and that was through Thumayma, Thuma the first woman that breastfed him. And then the second woman that breastfed the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was Shema's mother. I did for you, sisters, the story of Shema, who was the sister of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was when I did her story that a couple of the new shahadas asked me if I could do the story of her mother. So tonight, inshallah, I'm going to detail the story of Halima As. Asadi Asadia Halima Asadia, who was uh, uh, the mother of uh, Shema, and also she was the foster mother of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let me set everything up for you all. Um, take everything down so you'll be able to um, uh, take screenshots. And again, as with all the lectures I give, all my classes. Uh, cause my classes are, my lectures are not lectures really. They're classes because I'm teach, I'm a teacher, I'm not a lecturer. Okay. So let me take all the things down. I want you guys to take screenshots of everything of all my PowerPoint. So that way you can print it out at the end of class and uh, you have it as, in your notes as uh, the story of um, Halima Asadia. And uh, here it is. This is it? Let me share the, my screen with you guys to the, um, the PowerPoint. And for those on Zoom, give me a minute and now so I can check to make sure ain't nobody on the mic in here. Good, they're not on the mic. And let me share you guys uh, in the Zoom room. How did that happen when I gave myself rights? Hold on for a second. Gave myself rights and it still happens, huh? Hmm. Okay. All right, let me go on here. I'm going to share the Zoom people to Instagram, inshallah, if I can. Yeah. Okay, there it is. There should be Instagram. Hopefully, it'll get big for you guys. <laughs> okay. And let me pop myself back into, um, yeah, where I was with the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm going to make this screen larger. Did Instagram, it's not big enough for you guys here. Okay, I'm going to take the people on Instagram, I mean, on uh, Zoom room to YouTube to share you. So that way it's large enough. There it is. And I guess that's working. Yeah, it should be. Okay, so now let me take it full screen for everyone. So tonight, inshallah, we're going to do the story of Halima Asadia. Halima Asadia. Asadia. She was the one, the second woman, not the first. She was the second woman who breastfed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And her story is also a reminder of our Prophet Muhammad and his life story. So let's start it off here. Halima tells us in her own words how she ended up becoming the wet nurse for the prophet. First of all, back in the, in the 6th, 7th, 8th century, whenever an Arab woman gave birth to a child, they would not um, uh, breastfeed them themselves. They had wet nurses they would give the children to. So the wet nurses would take them to the country to live amongst them so that the children could learn the Arabic language. Okay. 
the foos high, not the slang that they speak today. Okay. Well, and the women were paid. The women were paid. These are, women earned their living being wet nurses for other women, mostly women of nobility. If you look at other cultures, the Egyptians, those women did not um, breastfeed their children either. They would hire wet nurses. Those were the noble women. Even the Romans, the Greeks, the Roman women, if a woman was of nobility, she would have would pay a wet nurse to nurse the child. So Halima tells us that there wasn't any woman amongst them who wasn't offered the choice of nursing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when they found out that he was an orphan, they would reject him. And the reason being is because the women were paid by the man. Back in those days, men took care of the family, not women. You were paid by the husband. So when they would find out that he was an orphan and he had no father, in Islam, any child that has no father is an orphan. The fact that he had no father, no one wanted to nurse him. But Halima said, this is how she made her living. Nobody wanted her to nurse their child either for whatever reasons. So when she failed in getting a baby for herself to nurse, because the children were already chosen by the women before her, she told her husband, she said, I am not going to be the only one who will go back home to the country without a, a nursling. So I'm going to go ahead and volunteer to take the orphan boy, the orphan baby that nobody wants. And her husband told her, go ahead, take him. And perhaps Allah will bring a blessing or something as a result. So Halima tells us she went and gathered the, the baby Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, the only reason she took him was because she couldn't find any other. All the other kids were picked. And she tells us as soon as she took him and brought him to her donkey, she breastfed him. And the breast just flew from out of her. The milk just flew from out of her breast. She said she never had that much milk before. And her own son, she also had a son of her own who was the same age, the age as the prophet Muhammad. She said after nursing the little baby Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she also nursed her son. And that was how much milk she had. Her milk was overflowing. So her husband then went to the camel and milked the camel and they drank the milk before going on their journey. And then they spent the night and they had a good night. And she said, even the camel, her husband told her that night, even when he milked the camel, the camel was overflowing with milk. So that morning, her husband told her, he said, Halima, I can see that whatever, whoever this child belongs to, this child is a blessed child because never did we have that much milk in the camel before. And look at how much milk you have in your breast. He said, can you imagine the blessings that we may experience with this child? So Halima tells us that they then set out and began their journey back to their village in the country. And she said, by Allah, her donkey walked so fast that none of her other, other women could catch up with it. And everybody was surprised at how fast that donkey was walking. That they asked her, they said, is this the same donkey that you had when you left your, your home? She said, yes. They said, well, what happened? This, the donkey was too slow. But now look how fast it is. So that's how they knew that there was something special about that child. 
she said, and when they arrived a, a, a home, remember they lived in a home that was barren. The farm that she had was mostly desert sand. Her sheep would graze and couldn't find much uh, grass to eat from. But when she arrived home with that baby, all of a sudden everything changed. She said her sheep grass appeared all over the place and her sheep had plenty to eat. And when they would go to milk the sheep, the sheep, all of her sheep had so much milk that, 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 that they could give it away. She said her sheep had so much milk that she would even give some to her neighbors. And the other people in the village told her, they said, subhanAllah, something is going on with your sheep. Our sheep can't find no food. Our sheep don't produce much milk, but yours are. They didn't know what she and her husband knew, that it was all because of this baby, this baby that she had taken in that nobody else wanted. So it was the Arabic uh, tradition or culture to, for the nurse, the wet nurse, to nurse the child until it was uh, two years old and then take it back to its mother. She tells us when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached Asia too, they noticed how he was much grown over the other children. He was bigger than they were, taller than they were. His skin was strong and thick and he was very beautiful. He was a handsome child. And when the time came for her and her husband to take him back to his mother, they were so sad at doing so because this child had been a blessing for them and their family. They didn't want to return him because they didn't want to go back to the lifestyle of poverty that they were experiencing before him. So when they reached Mecca and his mother came to get him, Halima tells us, uh, uh, um, uh, they begged her. They said, please let him stay with us another year. Let her, us keep him for another year. We heard that there's a pandemic. There's a pandemic going around in Mecca. Some of the children are getting sick. So they begged his mother, let us keep him for another year so that he, that pandemic won't get him. And they continued begging until she agreed. So they took the little boy back home with them. And then she tells us two or three months after they had returned back from Mecca, another weird incident occurred. He was playing with his foster brother in the backyard with the sheep. Suddenly the foster brother ran in the house and said, Umi, Umi, that Qureshi brother of mine, two men dressed in white garments came to see him. They grabbed him. They laid him down on the ground on his back and they cut open his stomach. So when their son told them that they ran outside, she said her and her husband ran outside to see what was going on. And they found the boy Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, standing up. And his, his face was a strange color. So the, her husband asked, what happened, my son? What happened? And the prophet told them, two men dressed in white came to me. They laid me on the ground and cut open my stomach. And they removed something and took it away. Then they sold me back up. So Halima then tells us they took him and the house calmed him down. And her husband became nervous. Her husband said, Halima, do you think that perhaps the jinn has possessed him? Because this is before Islam. Before Islam, guys, the Arabs were very superstitious. 
whenever something strange happened, they were quick to blame it on the jinn. So the way the prophet was acting as a young boy, and by the way, he was around five or six years old. He was around five or six years old when this happened. The way he was acting was so strange that it was normal to think it was gin possession. So her husband said, let's take him back home. Maybe we done kept him too long. We should have returned him when he was two, but we've kept him too long. Let's take him back before the gin decide to do something to us. So they gathered up his things and they took him back to Mecca and, and handed him back to his mother. When his mother saw him coming, she said, why are you bringing him back now? You were doing such a good job taking care of him. And they told her by Allah, he's okay. It's just that um, we've paid off our debts and we fear that something bad might happen to him. So that's why we're bringing him back home to you. But his mother didn't believe him. The prophet's mother insisted that they tell her the truth as to why they brought her and him back. And so finally his mother said, I know why you brought him back. Maybe y'all think that he's touched by a shaitan. Maybe y'all think that a jinn has him or something. Because Amina, who was his mother, she knew that he was a special child. They told her, no, no, it's not that. Uh, Shaitan will never be able to hurt him. They said, uh, uh, shall I tell you something about him? And that's when his mother said, when I was pregnant with him, I never felt like I was carrying anything lighter than him. And I had a dream that a light came out of me, which illuminated the palaces of Syria. And when I gave birth to him, I didn't go through any pain. She said, so I know my child is special. I know he's not touched by a gin. I know that he's just special. So leave him with me and you can go on about your way. So that's how uh, uh, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went from living with Halima for five years when he should have been returned when he was two. But they kept him because of the, all the good fortune that came their way. But after hearing what happened with him with these two men, you know, they took him home, believing he had been possessed, but his mother knew he was special and kept him. Later on, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told us that those two men that had come to him dressed in white were the angels, the angel Jabril and Michael, the two of the, of the greatest of the, dark, of the archangels. They were the ones that came. And of course, what did they cut out of his heart? They cut out the, the, of his heart, his gin, because he had reached the age of puberty or was nearing the age of puberty. And that's when your gin attaches. Okay, so what they did was they cut out his gin and made his gin Muslim and then put the gin back in his heart and sewed him back together. So, and this is, this is what happens with any prophet of Allah, and there will be no other prophets. You know, the prophets of Allah, their jinns were made Muslim <clears throat> by Allah. So that, that's why no prophet of Allah is capable of deliberately, intentionally disobeying Allah. So the prophet told us that that was the angel Jabril and Michael come to take, remove his heart and cleanse it so that the, his jinn uh, would be Muslim and not Kafir. So Halima had no contact with the Prophet Muhammad after that at all. There's no hadiths, no authentic hadiths or anything that mentions any other contact between them at all until the end of the Battle of Hunayn. After the, when the prophet Muhammad had become a messenger of Allah and was fighting against uh, 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 the Romans of Hunayn, 
That's when the prophet received goods and some prisoners of war and a delegation from the Hawazin who had converted to Islam uh, came to visit him. And they said, oh, messenger of Allah, we are a tribal people who have been touched with hardship. Please help us. And may Allah uh, uh, grant you favor. And amongst the captives of this war was Halima's daughter, Shema. And I did her story. She was taken as a prisoner of war. She was with the Hawazin, okay? Uh, those were her people. And uh, uh, she demanded to see the prophet. And everybody laughed at her because she was an old woman. And she kept referring to him as her brother. And that's when they uh, took her to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the prophet said, I, don't, I can't tell who you are because she was old. And she said, you remember when you were a baby, you bit me on my back. She said, I still have the scar on my back from when you bit me. And that's when the prophet realized she was his sister, Shema, and he hugged her. He kissed her hands. He took his garment off, his cloak off, and had her sit down next to him. And that's when he asked how are our parents, and she told him how they were. And that's when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam let the companions around him know that this is his, indeed his sister and that Halima, her mother, was his mother because she fostered him. And by the way, guys, Halima converted to Islam. Halima, her mother and her father had become Muslim and so did all his other foster brothers and sisters. And when the people that were the companions who were with the prophet found out that she was uh, his aunt, they were shocked. I mean, his, um, his sister, they were shocked. And even when her people found out that she was related, directly related to the leader of the people, that, the group that they fought against, you know, they said, oh, prophet of Allah, if we had known this, we would have never fought against you. If we had known that you were uh, uh, the foster brother and foster son of Halima and her husband, we would have never done this. So the whole tribe, her whole tribe ended up becoming Muslim. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam helped her people. He told them everything that is for me and the children of Abdul Muttalib is for Allah and for you. He let them know, I know you guys are going through a hardship. The simple fact that we are related. We are a tribal, a, you are a tribe of people related to me through the fostering of Halima. Whatever I have is yours. And so the prophet sent all these people of the Hawazin. He sent them back with gifts and food and money and wealth. He uh, freed all the captives of war. They all converted to Islam. He offered Shema to stay with him. He wanted Shema to go get her mother and father and everybody just stay with him. But Shema said, no, I'd rather go back with my people, teach Islam, we rather stay amongst our people. We are a simple people. We are a people of the desert. We are Bedouin. In other words, they were Bedouins, country. And so they chose to go back. And so that's where the story ends of Halima, who was the woman who nursed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by the way, just to let you guys know, we have no more information. There's no more hadiths on what happened to them or what happened to Shema. All we know is that they all became Muslim. The woman that nursed the Prophet, Halima and her husband became Muslim. All of their brothers and sisters became Muslim. The whole tribe became Muslim. And that's it. That's where the story ends. So alhamdulillah, that's the story of Halima, the second woman who nursed the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I hope I explained that uh, uh, to the sisters. 
So any questions or comments? Supana kala huma wa bihamdika, a shadow on Laila Haila Enta, stuck the ruko at two way lake. Are there any questions about her her story? Yeah, um, I was gonna ask afterwards, but you just cleared it up because I was so curious as to, you know, current day, where would those people reside? But you said that there's no more information. Yeah. Um they were of the Hawazin, the Hawazin tribe, and they were still out there, but she didn't yeah. um they didn't she they chose to go back home they were bedway it was a, it was a proud thing to be bedouin i mean because they stuck to the culture the arabic culture you know that's why the people would send their kids there to learn the classical fusa arabic you know and all the arabic culture they were a cultural tribe you know they were proud to be a bedouin and they didn't want to live amongst uh with the richest Cause the prophet said, you could stay with me. I'll take care of you. They didn't want none of that. They wanted, they were happy to live like they were as Bedouins. And that tribe still exists. It's a tribe, you know, but um, as far as what happened to them after that, we don't know anymore. Yeah, because you remember after the battle of Hunayn, it wasn't much longer after that, that the prophet died too. So that's how that story ends because he didn't live longer after that either. And they were related to him through suckling. They weren't related to those other companions. So that's how there's no more on there, too. Yeah. Any other questions? I had a question. So is Amina um, Um Ayman? Because we're. Um no, Ayman Amina was the Prophet Muhammad's mother. Oh, okay. So Um Ayman, when you did her story, she was the one that took care of her. Um, took care of the mom when the the dad beating the dad died and i was just trying to figure out um, where that is nusaiba the warrior of allah okay i'm okay let me go yeah back. you got I'm, all um, mixed I'm, up. I'm talking about the one that um his adopted uh son married baraka baraka no yeah. baraka was a slave an ethiopian slave black girl who was the slave for his mother she was oh, his goodness. mother's slave but when yeah. his mother died she because she was like 10 years old when his mother died she was the one that buried his mother with her own hands in the desert took him back to mecca and they as a payment for being for doing that they kept her they kept her as their slave. the uh, her his the abdul mutalib made her as the slave and told her your job will be to continue to care for the little boy. Yeah, so Bartika raised him like a mother. He grew, she, she, she was 10 years old, changed his diaper, and stayed with him until death. You know, that's okay. not the same as a wet nurse. A wet nurse is just a temporary woman. They, 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 they didn't, you know how you have a baby, you breastfeed. Arab women didn't breastfeed. They say, take them to the desert. They wouldn't let nobody play with their nipples. It was a thing. They didn't like nobody breastfeeding them, the noble women. Uh, so a wet nurse is a woman that breastfeeds you. Any woman, any baby that sucks the milk from a woman becomes their child. Even if it's a woman you don't know. Okay, but that's all. But Halima just played a role in his life for five years. Where was Baraka? Baraka was his mother's slave. Baraka was... We're taking care of his mother. Baraka was not hired to be his slave. Do you understand? She was his mother's slave. Yeah, I had it confused because I remember the story when you went over the story, but I was thinking that that was how did that become his mother? So that's why I was confused no, on that part. Since Baraka was a woman, just like before Islam, he referred to Zayd as his adopted son. Adoption was outlawed. Before Islam, it wasn't no such thing as mahrams and non-mahrams, okay? Baraka was a woman that's been in his life since he was six years old. She buried his mother. And so he and she raised him from with the, the Abdul Mutalib in him. So he began to call her Umi out of respect, just like you might call me auntie out of respect. And he looked at Baraka like a mother as a mother because she was in his life from the age of six until prophethood when he received the call to prophethood he was 40 
That's when Allah sent down the commands of Mahramship. He ain't got to worry about Mahram and her then because that's when he married her to Zaid. She was an old woman. Ba, ba, she became, you know, she married Zaid. But before Islam, Baraka was always in his life. When he married Khadijah, she lived with them. She moved in with, as, you know, he called her his mom, his stepmother, because she was with him since he was a kid. But she didn't nurse him. She was a little girl. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was getting that confused. I remember the whole story, but I was just had it confused now, on Monica what part only, she played in. By the time that when, when his mother died, she was around 10. And he was six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So he, he was only four years, she was only four years older than him then. Yeah, but she didn't nurse him. She was a kid. She was a kid too. Yeah. Yeah, she just he just referred her as being mother because she raised him. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, all the saying? story sound was uh, was familiar, and I remember the story, but I just couldn't remember yeah. how did it play in that part. Okay. Yeah, Halima was only in his life uh, up until the age of five. Then she never he never saw her again. It doesn't mention anything about him seeing her again or anything. He ran into Shema and didn't even know who she was because Shema was so old then, you know. So that's, yeah. Through Mema, he never remember her at all. She was the first woman that nursed him. He can't tell you nothing. That's why there's nothing about her. He don't didn't remember her at all. He was a baby. Yeah. But the Arabs kept a track of who they fought, who, who nursed, who they nursed because they've always believed in foster mothers. If you nurse a child, that child becomes yours. That's part of Arabic culture and tradition. So the wet nurses kept a, a list, a record of who they nursed. Yeah. Everybody got it? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow is Tuesday. We have the six o'clock class. And we have the uh, Hadith class at nine. I want to also encourage everybody, please support this Dawa effort. Uh, we don't have any money in our account. And uh, SubhanAllah, it's the first of the month in a couple of days. It takes $2,000 to pay our website expenses. Y'all know how much it costs to run programs, stream, and all that. We are a nonprofit organization. That means that we are a 5013C. 5013C, that means all your donations go to this website. They don't go in the pocket of anybody because we all have our own money here, our own jobs. We work, make our own money from other legal means. Okay, so, but please support us, guys. Uh, uh, scan the QR code and uh, support this dollar effort so we can get these expenses paid for this month, inshallah. All right, I'm going to sign out, close out for tonight. Inshallah, make sure everybody is here tomorrow. I can tell you right now for Sheikh Kareem Abu Zayd's book, Volume 2, Diluting Well or Well Better, Volume 2, read pages. Um, let me see. I'll let y'all know. Give me a second. See where we stopped off. It seems like the routine is that I'm doing only two pages a day with y'all for everything. But let me make sure. Oh, I got to look to see. It's all about the editing. Yes, it's all about how I edit. Okay, I'll tell y'all now. I'm looking at this. We stopped off on page 61. So tomorrow we'll pick it up and I'll give you a quiz at the end of it too. We'll start at page 61. Well, really 62. We're going to start at page 62 and we'll go through... Yeah. 62 uh, through 64, the top of 64. Yeah, I'm going to speak about that. I'll speak about that whole section there entitled, 
Igniting the Inner Light. Igniting the Inner Night, page 62 through 60, the top of 64. So we are, we're rolling two pages a day. It's going to take us a year. <laughs> but it's a lot of information that I have to break it down for you. Oh, did I freeze up? I ain't even looking at the screen, y'all. I'm probably froze. Let me see. Now you're good on YouTube. Oh, really? It didn't freeze because I show one looking at the screen. <laughs> okay. But alhamdulillah, so to be 62 uh, to 64 for diluting well I will better volume two. And then we have the Hadith book of Sheikh Atlee's entitled Termites for Tomorrow. All right. Please support this Dawah effort, guys. Supana kalahumu wa bihamdika, ashadu anla ilahaila enta, astakfiruka wa atubu.